Wow, you saved my life there. I appreciate it. <laughs> I had one job or two jobs, I guess. Um, so yeah, Family Nutrition Program is a grant funded program through the U of Ice Extension and you know, we provide SNAP eligible, for those aren't familiar, it's be food stamps, so low income um, families, individuals, and we're currently in 40 of Florida's 67 counties. So like I said, yeah, we provide um, resources to limited resource families to hopefully help them make uh, good food choices, like to say, make the healthy choice the easy choice. So I introduce myself. My name is Travis Mitchell. I'm located here in Gainesville and work with seven counties in Northeast Florida. Um, but I'm really the facilitator for this. And Sarah Boswick is with, with us today. She's a sustainable agriculture extension agent. She's got a bunch of experience um, being an organic farmer. And she's going to give us a jam-packed, absolutely loaded presentation on Gardening 101. And I'll turn it over to you, Sarah. Sounds good. Um, thank you, Travis, very much. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, as Travis said, my name is Sarah Bostic, and I am the Sustainable Agriculture Extension Agent with the University of Florida. Um, and I work uh, primarily in Sarasota County, but I have also served as the interim agriculture agent in DeSoto County for the last seven, seven or so months. Um, and um, as Travis said, my background is actually in farming, in produce farming, um, and um, at, as well as um, food access. So this, um, this is a topic that I really like to talk about because it really pulls together those two things. Um, and we're gonna dive right in. This is gonna be um, a really quick, um, quick dive um, through pretty much the entire umbrella of things that's really important to think about for successful gardens. Um, and this, you know, and, and so there's quite a few classes coming up through this series um, and then continued into the spring that will be a much deeper dive into, into these particular topics. But today's class is really to help you see um, and hopefully make some connections between all of the different pieces that need to work together um, to really have good success. So this is the basic, the basic schedule that we're gonna, um, I'm gonna zoom through really fast. Um, and I will definitely be available at the end for, um, for questions for about half an hour. Um, and I know that many of you this year are dealing with a really different school garden reality than ever before. Um, so we're also gonna, um, I'm gonna try to make sure that I highlight some things that might be particular to um, this year's strange reality of, you know, potentially bouncing back and forth between home and school um, and needing to bring your garden potentially with you. So here we go. Um, so the first, you know, the first piece, and this, this seems like such an obvious thing, um, but Florida is hot, it's humid, it's a really low latitude, and we have a lot of nematodes in the soil. Um, and I'll get into what nematodes are in a little bit. Um, but suffice it to say, this particular combination is really unique in the United States. There's not really anywhere else in the continental United States that has this, this particular um, unique combination. Um, and it makes gardening in Florida um, just really different than successfully gardening in most of the rest of the country, including most of the rest of the, of the Southeast. Um, we're just that much different. So as a starting point, choosing the right varieties is a, is a huge piece um, to go towards the success of, of actually growing in a school garden or a community garden or your backyard in Florida. Um, and for those of you who are lucky enough to be connected up with, um, with things like F&P um, and other programs that help you actually access the seeds and seedlings that you need, um, a lot of the work of choosing the right varieties is probably being done for you. Um, but if not, um, it's really worth keeping this in mind. Um, so if you go to something like a big box store, the bulk of the plants and the seeds that you can find there are the same generic plants, um, plants and seeds that are sold across the entire country. They're not necessarily the best fit for, for right here. So there's a, um, there's a little list of, of um, seed sources uh, that actually specialize in southern varieties that tend to do better right here in Florida. Um, they, um, they often have breeding programs in the southeast. So because of that incredibly hot, humid, um, and challenging soil um, conditions that we have, um, starting with healthy plants is even more important than it is elsewhere. Um, this is actually a, a, um, 
uh, delivery of seedlings that I once ordered from a really reputable greenhouse in a different state. And they must have been having a serious off week. Um, this is a, a tray of about 100 bok choy plants that were really badly diseased when I got them. And if you start with plants that are not healthy, um, you're just setting yourself up for failure um, just for this season, but also for following seasons because many of the diseases that affect plants actually live in soil. So don't bring diseased plants into your, um, into your environment, which can sometimes be easier said than done. And if you have trouble figuring out whether or not a plant is just, you know, maybe, maybe just needs some water or didn't get enough sunlight, or if it's a disease, um, reaching out to your extension office with really good pictures can be a great start to figuring out whether or not the plants you have are healthy. So for those of you who might be bouncing around a little bit or trying to, to do kind of a, a demo in your own backyard, if you happen to be, if you think you're going to be working from home more than typical this year, um, just want to make a special note about urban soil. Um, if you do live in an urban area in Florida or in a house that is um, that is about 50-ish years old or older, um, it's a really decent chance that the soil um, in and around, or around your house is actually um, fairly substantially contaminated with lead. Um, and lead is, um, is harmful to people of all ages. So if you are in an urban area or you're hoping to garden right next to an old house, um, it's probably better to not garden right in that native soil. Um, you can always send your soil off to a lab to get it tested, um, but if you want to skip that step and assume that you've got some soil contamination issues, um, it's probably a best bet to just go with actually um, bringing in soil of some sort into your small space. So for, for things like um, pots or small planters or earth boxes, probably the best way to get your hands on what you need is just to buy bagged potting soil from some sort of um, box store or hardware store or um, uh, um, uh, a nursery, that, that sort of business. Um, if you feel really inspired to make your own potting mix, um, you can, you certainly can. Um, you can start with um, bagged compost or your own compost. Um, and then you want to, you really want to add something to make it fluffy. If you go with straight compost, um, it will end up getting really compressed. Um, every time you water, it's going to push all the air right out of, out of that mix. And you're going to end up with really compressed, um, kind of unhappy soil. So adding something to make it fluffy is really helpful if you're making your own mix. So something like coconut coir, peat moss, perlite. And I'll go in a little bit into what one of these things are in a moment. Um, so potting soil can be a really mysterious thing for folks. Um, for those of you who like to read ingredient lists, um, you may have turned over a bag of potting soil and started reading the ingredients in it and um, immediately felt a little confused or concerned about what you were, you, you were reading. Things like um, aged fir bark, alfalfa meal, fishbone meal, beneficial soil microbes, like, you know, what, what, are, what are these crazy things, right? Um, those are actually relatively common things to see on the bag of the back of an ingredient list on, on potting soil. Um, one of the ingredients that, that tends to cause people the most confusion is, um, you can see over here in this picture, the little white dots that are, um, that kind of look like styrofoam mixed into the soil in this raised bed. Um, that's actually called perlite. It's, um, you can see somewhere up here. Well, it's, some, it's somewhere on this list up here. There we go, third ingredient in this particular bag. So perlite um, looks and feels very much like styrofoam, but it is actually a rock. It is a mined rock that is then mechanically crushed and um, heated up and popped like popcorn. Um, it's like a superheated rock. And, and that's just a good, um, it, holds, it holds air in potting soil. So that's why you often see that stuff that looks like styrofoam in potting soil. It's not, it is a rock. Um, one side note on, on choosing potting soil, um, there are a couple of brands of potting soil that are on the market that have um, peanut hulls or peanut shells in them. Um, if you know that you are working with kids that have peanut allergies, um, it is a very good idea to read the ingredient list on your potting soil to make sure that there's no peanut byproduct in that potting soil. So in Sarasota County, um, down here on the, the Gulf Coast of Florida, um, we get a lot of questions, um, especially from 
from folks that are in community gardens and school gardens about whether or not they should buy organic or synthetic fertilizer. So um, if you are not governed by any sort of rules, um, then that's really a personal decision to make. Um, but I know down, down here in Sarasota County, um, most of our community gardens and school gardens, um, basically the, their bylaws are that they have to use organic products. So if you want to or have to use organic fertilizers or organic potting mixes or things like that, this right here, this is the symbol that you wanna look for on a bag, OMRI listed for organic use. Um, that's, that's what tells you that it is a product that is um, actually, in, actually an organic um, product and not a product that's basically been greenwashed um, to make you think that it would be suitable for, um, for use on organic farms or organic gardens. So regardless of whether or not you choose an organic or a synthetic fertilizer, um, it's really important to follow the application rate instructions on that package. Um, I think in general, um, we have a tendency to think that if a little bit is good, more must be better. Um, and in the case of fertilizer, more is, more is really not better. Um, and it often will actually create some unanticipated um, and unwanted uh, side effects if you use too much fertilizer. Um, one of which is kind of an, an issue that we have across the state, which is that because we have such porous, sandy soil, every time it rains or we water, those excess nutrients that are in the, in the fertilizer that we're using actually leaches out and into surface and groundwater. So that's, that's, a, that's a big problem that all of us can do our part in solving by um, not going with the more is better maxim. And then other side effects of using too much fertilizer are things like um, the fact that um, having too much nitrogen available to your plant can actually worsen some sort of insect infestations, especially aphids. That's a big one that'll, um, aphid um, uh, blooms will quickly get out of control. So easier said than done though, right? So when you turn over the back of a bag of fertilizer, um, and this is just an example, um, there's a lot of information on the back of that bag. And so trying to figure out how to follow these directions especially when you're working with, um, with students. Um, you know, so looking at this, you know, you've got different directions for tomatoes, then for cucumbers, then for carrots, different directions for new plantings versus established plantings versus plantings in containers. Um, so where do you even start? And certainly if you tell the fourth graders that you're working with that the best way to, to fertilize the cucumber in your raised bed is to use one and a half cups per 10 square feet of growing area or eight cups for every 50 feet of row, um, that's going to be a disaster, right? That is, um, those, are, those are directions that um, aren't going to go over well <laughs> when, when you're working with groups of most kids. So this is really my solution to most things when I'm working with with young people in small spaces. Um, I always have a tablespoon um, or a whole, um, a whole measuring spoon set with me. Uh, for most plants, about a tablespoon of, of fertilizer, if you're, on the, if you're using organic fertilizer, about a tablespoon is about the right amount to start plants with. Um, and next we're gonna talk about when do you fertilize. Um, but just, just having a spoon or a set of measuring spoons on hand really goes a long, long way to making sure that you're not over fertilizing and that fertilizer does not end up everywhere when you're working with young people. So the when do I fertilize bit, that's, that's a little, that there can, it can be a little confusing without a doubt. So I like to break it down into four basic categories. And if you can remember um, these four basic categories, um, that'll really take you a long way. The first category is single harvest leafy greens, like a head of lettuce, where you plant it, when it's ready to eat, you harvest the entire thing, like the whole head of lettuce. Um, lettuce grows really fast. It's a, if you start it from a seedling, um, if you transplant a seedling, it only takes about 30 days until it's ready to harvest. So one time is really how much it needs to be fertilized, basically when you plant it. For greens that you harvest multiple times, like um, kale, collards, Swiss chard, things like that, you generally um, are going to fertilize about two times, once when you plant, and then around the time that the plants are mature, you know, a week or two after you've started harvesting to give them a little boost of energy. And then the third category I like to think about is root crops. Um, root crops are really, um, are really interesting. So 
um, a lot of what uh, bagged fertilizer does is promote a lot of um, fruit and leaf growth. Well, you don't want fruit and leaf growth with root crops. Um, if you fertilize root crops too much, um, they put all of their energy into producing bigger leaves and big, beautiful flowers. Um, and you don't want radishes that are all leaves. Um, you want radishes that are mostly root. Um, so it's really important actually to only um, fertilize root crops pretty minimally, generally one time. Um, there's a handful of root crops, like if you happen to be growing, you know, like doing something like a, a giant turnip growing contest, you might need to um, fertilize that giant turnip a couple of times. Um, and then the last category is fruit crops. So it takes a lot of energy for a plant to produce fruit. Um, all of the sugar that goes into it, all, pulling up all that water to, to fill that fruit takes a lot of energy. So three times is usually the right amount to, to har um, fertilize a fruiting crop, like a tomato, uh, pepper, eggplant, that sort of thing. So it's when you plant it, when the plant is almost mature, and then when that plant starts to make fruit. Those are kind of the three magic times. Okay. So watering. Um, watering is hard to figure out. It is really, really challenging to figure out um, the best way to water, how much to water, when to water, especially when um, your garden is at school and you are not there all the time. Um, I think in the spring, um, and maybe Travis or Carly, if you can just um, confirm in the chat box, um, I think there's a session in the spring um, with this series that is all about, um, all about watering, like a deep dive into everything you need to know about watering for your school gardens. But I'm gonna, um, breeze through really quickly. So how, how much should I water, right? It's, it is such a hard question. And part of what makes it so hard is that it always depends. Um, how much you should water is going to change basically every day. Um, and that's part of what makes it so tricky. So for, you know, for example, if, it is, if your plants are really big and your soil is bare and it's really sunny and it's really, really hot out, those plants are going to need a whole lot more water than plants that are really small, growing in soil that you have nicely mulched, growing in the shade when it's only a little bit hot in Florida, right? The, the amount of water those two scenarios need is really different. But there's some rule of thumb. And so one is that the smaller the plant is, the less water it needs. And that, that seems kind of obvious, um, but what that doesn't mean is that you are necessarily going to water less often with small plants. Um, small plants also dry out really quickly, um, just like large plants do. Um, but it's mostly, mostly because um, you can't flood small plants with as much water at a time. So you need to, they, you, they still need to be watered pretty much just as frequently. And then regardless of the size of the plant, you're gonna definitely conserve water by just mulching that soil cover that soil up with something. Wood chips, Spanish moss is actually one of my favorite things to mulch with. Um, pine needles, um, a lot of people are, are scared of pine needles because they think it will acidify their soil too much. Um, but as long as you don't actually incorporate those pine needles into the soil, shouldn't have too much problems, too many problems rather. Um, one, one little um, side note um, is I know a lot of folks love mulching with, um, with mulch straw or, or hay. Um, you need to be a little careful about mulching with straw. Um, in, the, um, in the deep south, there are um, most of the mulch straw is grown um, on pasture land that is sometimes um, used to graze livestock. And um, there's quite a few poisonous pasture weeds that grow in there that will actually um, make livestock really sick. Um, so in the southeast, uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks that manage big hay fields use, um, use a, a type of, or a category of, pesticide, uh, a category of herbicide that's kind of classified as persistent herbicide. Um, and those, um, those herbicides can remain active on hay um, for quite a while and stay active in your soil for um, between two and 10 years, depending on um, what, you, what, what kind of herbicide it was. So definitely proceed with caution on using hay to mulch. So, you know, this is just another way to think about it. You know, think of like, look at that plant. Um, you know, a mature tomato plant needs much more water than that two inch seedling does. But just remember that they still need water on a very regular basis. 
So one, one thing that I often see people struggle with from the get-go um, where is, um, is not watering. Um, so at the beginning of the growing season, basically, um, especially the spring growing season in, in Florida, which is, you know, we're still in the dry season, um, is planting, planting seedlings directly into um, a really dry raised bed or really dry soil. Well, that soil hasn't had the chance to actually rehydrate after our long dry, um, dry season. And so the, the, nice, um, the nice moist uh, little uh, soil blocks of, of um, plant roots that you're putting into that soil uh, and that very dry soil, it's gonna actually suck all of the water right out of those seedlings that you just transplanted. So you will have far more success if you actually spend um, some time really rehydrating your, your beds or your pots about, about two days, starting about two days before you actually transplant into them. Um, and you, can, you will use um, a pretty tremendous amount of water to actually do it justice. Um, and um, the, the best, best rule of thumb is you pretty much want to actually be able to feel water at least, like if you put your hand straight down into that soil, you wanna make sure that at least all the way down to like where your wrist is, um, is hitting the soil, um, you want at least that deep. So like at least six inches deep into the soil, you wanna make sure it's totally saturated before you plant seedlings in it. Um, this is just a picture of a few different ways of, um, of mulching in a few different settings. Um, you have, you know, like a, a farm setting. Um, you can actually see in that farm picture, um, these two beds of lettuce that were planted on the same day, same varieties. Um, you can see that the mulched bed of lettuce um, is faring a lot better than that bare soil bed of lettuce. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We can go more into that in the question and answer time. Um, this right here is actually a potted pomegranate tree um, that is mulched with Spanish moss. It's a great way to keep this tree more hydrated. Um, and this is actually the demo gardens at our Sarasota County office. Um, and we have both the pathways and the beds uh, mulched. Okay. So the, the next topic, um, and this one, this one's always a bit of a fun, fun experience with kids, um, is spacing. How, how, do you, how do you accurately space in your, in your school garden or your community garden? Um, and it's, I like to think of it kind of, kind of like the Goldilocks and the Three Bears sort of scenario. Um, and I love, I love this picture. This is um, a picture actually of um, one, of my, um, one of my interns when I was working on campus at the University of Florida a few years ago, running a, um, a student farm on campus. Um, and this is, um, you can see he, has, he, has, he does have big hands, um, but um, regardless, that is a very small cauliflower in his big hand. Um, and that cauliflower is completely mature. Um, it, will, it, will not, um, it will not get any bigger than that. The next thing that would happen with that cauliflower is that it would start producing flowers. And it was because it was planted very, very close um, to a bunch of other cauliflower. And so they matured, they were actually beautiful. They were just kind of hors d'oeuvre size uh, cauliflower instead of full, full size heads. So that's, that's one thing that spacing too close causes is really small, plants. Um, more often than not, um, it also causes plants that are kind of stunted, misshapen. Um, they'll, they'll flower sooner than you want them to. Um, and then you definitely get more mold, mildew, and disease issues when you have really, really too close spacing. And then on the other end, with spacing too far apart, this, you know, like if you're going to err on one side or the other, err on the side of too far apart, because too far apart causes some wasted space, a little more space for weeds to come up, which isn't really an issue if you're mulching. Um, if you're not mulching, you get more bare soil. And then plants that are really heavy, like tomatoes or peppers, are a little bit more unstable. So you might have to actually stake them. Um, and so if you're, if, you know, if you're gonna err on too close apart or too close or too far apart, err on the side of too far apart in your community garden or your school garden. You'll have much better luck. So how do you know how far apart things are supposed to be planted? Well, if you're using seed packets, that information, and I just kind of, I just copy and pasted this information right here off the back of the seed packet and blew it up right here. Um, it tells you, you know, you it tells you how deep to put those seeds. And that's actually really important, that how deep piece. Um, if you plant too, um, too shallowly, um, big seeds won't get enough um, enough root down in the soil and they'll be floppy, spindly, kind of unhappy plants. 
And for really small seeds, if they're planted too deep, um, they don't have enough energy stored in that little capsule, that little seed capsule to actually push all the way to the surface of the soil. So you'll get poor germination. Um, and then it tells you right through there how, how far apart to plant everything, how to thin it. Um, and, and so in terms of spacing information, that's really great information to pull off the back of a seed packet. I do want to highlight, however, um, that not all information on seed packets um, is, um, is, is good guidance for Florida. So for example, this um, kohlrabi packet um, says that it is frost tolerant and that you should sow it uh, or plant it in spring or late summer. So if you ever see that particular pairing of words, that it is both frost tolerant and that you should plant it during the summer, um, you know those directions were not written for Florida, right? <laughs> so something that is frost tolerant will um, be absolutely miserable um, and, not, um, and not thrive in this any time close to summer in Florida. Um, and then over here, this is another way you'll sometimes see, um, see this information that's written just as a very generalized information for the whole country that doesn't work for Florida, or for most of Florida anyway, um, is that you should um, sow it in late summer for a fall harvest, four to six weeks before your average lot last frost date, well, in this region of Florida that, that I'm in, we don't get frost. Um, and so those are just not relevant directions. Okay, so one of the biggest things that I hear from folks that are just getting into gardening and um, figuring out how to be successful with gardening is that they get so excited about gardening. Um, and so they plant everything and then they harvest everything and then there's nothing left. So oops, there we go. I don't know what happened there. Um, so the, um, the best way to make sure you always have um, things to harvest in your garden is this idea called succession planting. It's, a, it's something that, um, that farmers actually um, spend a huge amount of time in their off-season planning. They, um, they plan you know, like right down to the last um, detail exactly what their entire um, year's worth of succession plantings are going to be, when they're going to happen, and all of that. And, and you can actually do that um, on a little garden scale to make sure you have continuous harvest. And so one of the best ways to start that process is just to think, um, for, for me anyway, is to kind of create different blocks of, of information for myself. And one is um, a category that I like to just call like one harvest and done. Um, so those are the, that's the whole category where once you harvest it, um, there isn't any more. It's just, it's gone. So unless you're continuously planting more of it, you really only get it one time that season. So things like single harvest leafy greens, um, most, uh, all of the root crops and heads of things, um, things like onions, cabbage, broccoli, those are, you harvest it once and it's done. Um, and then there's the category of two to 10 harvests. Um, you know, the things that you'll harvest multiple times before it finally gives out. Um, so things like um, greens that usually you grow to full size, like kale and collards. Um, salad greens, there's a lot of salad greens that you can grow where if you grow them as baby greens, um, you can harvest them two or three times before they start getting tough. Um, and then fruits. So you plan for those two things really differently. And I think, um, and uh, y'all correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's actually a session about succession planting coming up. Um, but just as a general rule of thumb, if, you, if the part of the plant that you eat is a root or a head, you can expect one harvest from it. And if the part of the plant you eat is a leaf or a fruit, you can generally expect two to 10 harvests from it. So hopefully those two rules of thumb will help you think about how often you need to plant something to make sure you always have it. So pests, pests are, um, incredible in Florida. Um, I farmed for many years in other parts of the country um, and I came to Florida about four or five years ago and um, I was fairly shocked by the incredible diversity and year-round persistence of pests in Florida. Um, they're year-round um, and one of the reasons that um, pest control in Florida is, um, is so unique is that we are basically in a part of the world where two really different um, climate zones come together. So we get most of the insect pressure that um, the, the region north of us gets, as well as most of the insect diversity that the region south of us gets. So we really get two kind of two climate regions worth of pests all rolled into one. 
And so it's really important to remember though that not all insects are pests. Um, some of them are actually incredibly beneficial um, and are not only um, you know, beneficial to your garden, they're also just an amazing teaching tool with kids. So you know, the, the example that most people know about are ladybugs. There's actually quite many, many, many beneficial insects um, um, like these ladybugs in the picture. So um, I would highly encourage you um, to, uh, I have some resources to share with you all, but start learning what some of the beneficial insects look like so that you can actually start to notice, you know, do you have like a really healthy um, functioning ecosystem of insects that are starting to do their own insect control um, so that you don't have to be the one managing those insects are, or is every single last insect you see on your plants something that's just going to destroy your garden. Um, and so, um, reaching out to your local extension office is one really great resource to help learn about that. So this, um, this is a word that I mentioned in the very, very beginning of the, um, of the webinar, nematodes. Um, and I love, um, well, when we were still teaching in-person classes, I would always ask folks um, if they had heard of nematodes. And then, I don't know, an average class of maybe 30 people, I would, I would typically have somewhere between zero and one person in the class who had heard of nematodes before. Um, so nematodes um, are truly phenomenal. They are um, a microscopic parasitic roundworm. Um, they are the most uh, biolog, they're, they're the, um, there's 20,000 different varieties, different species of nematodes around the world. And um, they're the most biologically diverse multicellular organism on the planet. And the vast majority of humanity has never heard of them. Um, but I can guarantee you that if you have ever gardened in Florida, um, you have been affected by them. Uh, so for example, um, that is um, my hand in, that, in the picture on the right that is holding um, the extremely gnarled root system of a tomato plant. Um, that is a tomato root system in my hand. Um, any of you who have ever pulled out a tomato plant from the ground know that that is not what a tomato root system should look like. Um, that's actually a plant that was growing in the raised bed demo garden at my office. Um, and this is a tomato plant that is um, very infested by a type of nematode called guava root knot nematode. Um, and uh, nematodes love raised beds. They're actually the trickiest place in Florida to grow produce in terms of nematodes. Uh, the carrots that you see in the picture on the left um, were in the ground for about four months when I pulled them out. This is also from the garden at work. Um, and um, they are exactly the size they look like in this picture, which is about an inch and a half long. Um, and those carrots um, should have been about nine, nine to 10 inches long each. Um, and you can see the little balls at the end of those root systems. That's from nematodes. Um, the, two, um, the two pictures on your left, um, that's a cucumber, um, cucumber plant root system, also from my office. Um, you're hearing a theme here that the demo beds at my office are very infested with nematodes. Um, and one of the reasons actually that I don't really do much to get rid of them is because it makes a really awesome demo, right? Um, most people have never heard of a nematode. So when I can actually pull plants out of the soil and, um, and show people what it looks like, um, it, it clears up so many mysteries for, for so many people who are struggling with gardening in Florida. Um, nematodes look different under microscopes, um, but that is um, the, the, the obviously microscopic picture on the screen is a microscopic picture of one particular type of nematode. So not all garden plants or not all vegetable garden plants um, have the same susceptibility to nematodes. Um, nematodes generally prefer um, uh, plants that produce a fruit or a root, um, so um, aka sugar. They like things that have some sweetness involved, um, so like carrots, beets, uh, tomatoes, peppers, those sorts of things. Nematodes um, don't, however, tend to like um, most of the greens that we eat and most of the herbs that we eat, which is pretty darn handy. So if you know that you have um, really bad nematode problem in your raised bed garden or in your backyard garden or, or wherever it might be, um, stick, with, stick with, um, with greens and herbs for a while until you get those nematodes back under control. Um, and just a side note for those of you who are growing in pots this year, 
Um, POTS are actually a great way to avoid nematodes entirely. Um, just make sure that you don't use any, um, any native soil or soil out of a existing raised bed. Um, start over with brand new bagged potting soil and keep your pots propped up off the ground on something like bricks. And that'll, you'll totally avoid the nematodes that way. So there's, um, besides just, you know, growing only kale and, and basil, um, for example, there are other ways that you can, um, you can work with getting the nematode populations under control in your garden. Um, and one of which is making sure that there's always lots of good organic matter in your soil. Um, and organic matter, the easiest way to think about that um, is that organic matter is simply anything that is or once was alive. Um, compost, leaves, um, wood chips, um, anything that's gonna decompose down into your garden. Um, that organic matter is where the healthy soil food web exists in your soil. Um, and that healthy um, soil food web will include a lot of beneficial um, microbes that will actually eat the nematodes that are damaging your plants. Um, there's um, seed companies like the ones that I listed um, at the beginning, and I'll share those, those names of seed companies with y'all. Um, um, and follow-up email. But the, those seed companies all um, sell varieties that have nematode resistance um, bred into them. Um, not all of the varieties they sell, but many of the varieties they sell will be marked with um, some degree of nematode resistance. Um, you know, starting with clean soil, you know, like if you know that your old raised bed had bad nematodes, don't shovel that soil out into your new raised bed. Using mulch really helps for that, um, that soil food web purpose. Um, your hands and your tools are going to be the primary things that move nematodes around. They don't move very far in their own lives, really just a few inches. So your hands and your tools, um, for many reasons, you should be washing between uses anyway, um, but that'll also help with nematodes. Um, just don't, don't grow things like tomatoes for a few years in beds that are, you're having a lot of troubles with. Um, and then certain strong smelling flowers and other things, uh, other strong smelling plants um, like marigolds can have some degree of impact on nematodes. Um, none of these things are a, a silver bullet. Um, some folks um, uh, go with solarization each year and solarization is literally using the sun, the solar rays to cook the soil. Um, and it cooks the nematodes and every other living thing in your soil. Um, so you basically start over with building that healthy soil food web each year. Um, but a lot of folks, um, for, for a lot of folks, this is what works. Um, and, and the basics of solarization is that you put a big sheet of clear plastic over your garden bed um, and seal it for a few weeks during the middle of the summer and it just cooks it. There are also plenty of very special urban pests for those of you who are in urban areas. And some of these are also issues in rural areas, um, but these are all critters that folks in particularly urban areas um, struggle with. Um, and to some, to some degree, um, there's no way around it unless you build a fortress <laughs> around, around your garden. Um, but some tips to remember, is that most of the urban critters um, that you can see up here on the screen, um, cats, not cats obviously being an exception, but most of the urban critters really love the fruits and the roots, um, the same things that the nematodes love. Um, they love the sugars that are in there. So most of the urban pests don't, don't really care much for greens or herbs. So if you're really struggling with, with things like um, squirrels, um, sticking with greens and herbs might, might help. Um, and then um, some urban critters, like especially like squirrels and, um, and crows, they're so curious. Um, and when they notice that you have recently buried something like seeds or seedlings, they like to dig it up to see what it is that you have put down there. Um, and so um, if you know that you have critters in your area, um, you, you probably are going to need to cover um, you know, through like some sort of cage or some sort of enclosed system, at least until those plants get established. And then cats. Um, cats are so cute and cats so like to poop in gardens. Um, cats, um, unlike dogs, cats bury their poop um, and it is easiest to bury poop in nice fluffy 
viable soil, um, such as your garden. Um, and that can be a really big problem um, in, in parts of the state. Um, and actually, I looked it up and I forgot to write it down, or I wrote it down, but I forgot to have the paper with me about how many cats there are in Florida. Um, so don't quote me on this one, but I think I remember that there are a hundred, uh, sorry, a million cats in Florida that have homes and an estimated million um, cats in Florida that don't have a home. That is a, that is a lot of potential um, critters uh, pooping in your garden space. So cats don't like to um, dig through thick mulch to get down to that nice fluffy soil. Um, and they also don't tend to poop in container gardens. Um, and the reason that I really wanna highlight this is that um, there, are, there are so many feral cats in Florida um, and cat poop is, um, is a very major um, human health issue, um, major, major food safety issue. So um, what, if, um, what if cats and squirrels and other fluffy things are not your biggest pest issues? Instead, they are things like iguana and deer. Um, that is a whole, it's a whole nother universe. Um, so deer can actually jump um, an eight to 10 foot fence. So if you have a really large garden, you know, like if you have maybe an entire quarter acre fenced in, you need to make sure that that fence is a bare minimum of eight feet high to keep deer out or is an electrified fence or some, some combination therein. Um, if you have a really small garden, um, deer, um, if deer can't perceive how far they're jumping before they're gonna hit another barrier, they won't jump it. Um, and so if you have a pretty small garden, a relatively low fence will actually work okay for deer, you know, somewhere in the realm of, of five feet high. Um, but deer can, be, deer can be really hard to keep out unless you simply just have them barricaded out. Um, and if you are in South Florida, um, iguanas may be something that you struggle with. Um, iguanas is something I am just learning about. I got my first iguana call um, just two or three weeks ago from some gardeners down in the southern part of Sarasota County. So they are making their way up um, and they unfortunately, just like deer, do like to eat greens. Um, and so keeping things caged is kind of keeping your plants caged in at this moment in time is kind of the best strategy we have for iguanas. Um, and I think Carlita has some extra information that she'll be able to share about iguanas. Um, Carlita, sorry if I put you on, this, on the spot with information sharing, following up. I'm, I think you're the one who told me you had extra iguana info to share. Um, and then, of course, diseases. There are a lot of plant diseases. Um, in fact, too many to name, too many to count. Um, and you know, I've, I've actually been farming and in agriculture education for about 20 years. Um, and I, I hope that in 20 years, I will be able to identify half of all the plant diseases that commonly affect um, uh, crops in Florida. Um, just by sight, but most of them, most of them you actually just um, will need to send off to a laboratory to get an 100% ID, right? And that's not realistic for most home gardeners. So, um, you know, you don't necessarily need to know exactly what the disease is, um, but if you do need to figure out what to do about a disease or how to keep it under control, um, you know, or what to do with an iguana or a squirrel or a cat or um, a caterpillar or, or any of the other issues that you might be having with your garden. Um, there's a lot of resources that are available and a really, really good starting point is to simply call up your local extension office. Um, there are, there's a couple of universities, University of Florida is not the only one in the state, of course, that has um, an extension program. Um, but this, because I work for University of Florida Extension, um, I'm providing you with a, a link to um, how to, how to find your local extension office. Um, and they can definitely give you a lot of help in figuring out what you're struggling with. Um, I find it's also incredibly helpful for folks to go visit other gardens and see what's going on and see what seems to be working and what's not um, in other areas. Um, most county extension offices actually have a demonstration garden, so that can be a really good place to go learn. Um, we, uh, we have people that pop into our garden all the time because they're just trying to figure out how to garden in Florida. And I just go out into our demo garden with them and we hang out and talk about, you know, what's working, what's not. I pull plants out of the ground to show what root systems look like. Um, we pick at bugs, we look at things under microscopes. So um, definitely use your extension office um, and especially the ones that have demo gardens. Um, 
And then if you want to try to figure out um, some, uh, some things on your own or have some neat projects for students that you work with, um, there's some really, really good um, online insect ID guides. Um, there are online vegetable and fruit crop disease guides, all sorts of things. Um, but I really want to, um, to highlight um, and explain why I have a picture of the salt shaker um, on this screen. Um, it is, um, it, it, there actually is a connection to this salt shaker. And it is simply that Florida is really unique, right? And so there's a huge number of resources that are out there on the internet, you know, things like YouTube videos, websites. There's also all sorts of gardening books. Um, and some of them are really helpful. But I would, I would really encourage you to take most of what you are reading that is not Florida specific with a grain of salt um, because Florida is just so unique um, and so so much of what works in other parts of the country just doesn't really work very well here. So a great way, um, this, is, this is to me one of the best resources that are out there in terms of um, vegetable gardening in Florida. Um, the name of the book um, tells it tells it. Um, and one of the things I like the most about this is that it breaks, uh, it's a, I'm going to say a hundred-ish page book maybe, um, and it's incredibly helpful. It goes through a lot of the same information that I'm talking about today. And then at the back, there's a series of really handy charts that tell you things like the right planting date in Florida in the three different parts of Florida, right? And you can see they're really different dates. Um, so it just breaks it down really nicely depending on where you live. University of Florida also has some great online um, resources, um, including this series of calendars um, called Edibles to Plant in July. Um, and um, it's broken down by month to the different regions of Florida. And you can see planting in July um, is not a successful proposition. Um, this is the month we're in right now, the lovely month of October. Um, and so it just, it just goes through and tells you basically based on each region what you should be growing when. And we'll send you links to these as well. Okay, so I just want to throw in a few, um, a, a few things that are specific to how unique this year is. You know, for any of you who are, have decided to simply grow, grow in pots this year so that you can move your school garden um, between school and home if need be, um, I just have a series of really quick tips I want to share with you. Um, and one is just to remember that the amount of root um, that is growing underneath the ground is about equivalent to the amount of plant above ground. So make sure that you pick a pot that's big enough for the mature plant. Um, if, you, if you pick a pot that's too small, your plant will, will probably always really struggle. Um, you can get really creative with what you use to put plants in, right? It doesn't have to be something that was necessarily um, manufactured exactly for planting what it is you want to be planting. Um, the one little caveat I wanna um, say is that if you are repurposing things that were not meant, to, oops, not meant to be plant pots, things like this old whiskey barrel that is full of water, make sure that you put some drainage holes in it. Otherwise, you will end up with a plant that drowns um, in, that, in that whiskey barrel. But there's, I mean, you can, you can get so creative, all sorts of containers that you can use, um, planters, pots, buckets, um, one really quick side note on um, terracotta. Um, terracotta is so lovely, um, but it is, um, it's a really breathable, pourable material, which means that it dries out really, really quickly. Um, and all of the plants that you see in these two pictures are very water stressed. These are plants that have chronically had um, very much not enough water. They will never be healthy. So if you do use unglazed terracotta, um, just know that you are gonna be like a full-time waterer and then if any of you are, are having to um, or choosing to start seeds at home this year, um, sufficient light is gonna be the trickiest part about um, starting seeds at home. It is absolutely doable. It's really fun if you've never done it, um, but finding the absolute brightest, most direct light in your house is the um, key to success. When you see plants um, like these seedlings here that are, have this lovely arc to them or these lettuce seedlings here that are also arcing, those are plants that are desperately leaning towards light. They've actually changed the shape of their, of their being because um, they are so desperate for light. Those are plants that are not getting enough. So if you see that curve, you know you need to find a brighter window. 
And then just a couple more little tips on growing in pots. If, you have, if you're growing in pots this year and you never have before, um, you may find that some of the plants that you're growing um, need some extra support, um, like some sort of trellising or fencing or just some sort of support structure. Um, plants growing in pots um, just don't have as much soil to hold on to as plants growing in the ground. Um, and so they're, they're a little more floppy. They, they tend to jump ship a little more easily. So give them some support. Um, and then um, if you are growing in pots or, you know, or not, um, space can become an issue. So making sure that you provide support to the vegetables that like to climb, things like cucumbers, peas, pole beans. Um, you know, this is a cu cucumber plant growing um, in my office um, that I actually just trained up um, a tomato cage. It worked great. And then just remember that some vegetables don't climb. Um, like we think of them as, as vines like tomatoes, but tomatoes actually um, don't, aren't really vines. Um, you have to, in order to get them to grow up, um, you have to clip them on, um, clip or tie them on to whatever support you have. Um, and then, you know, if you're growing in pots, heavy, heavy vegetables in general, um, or heavy, heavy fruiting plants are going to fall over a lot more easily than they do in a raised bed. So even if you've never had to, to um, give support to your eggplant or peppers um, in a raised bed, you probably will in a pot. So just plan for that. And that is the absolute whirlwind, full speed ahead, um, kind of umbrella um, presentation I have for you on successful uh, gardening. So um, I am ready for questions, I think. And Travis, back over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. Can you all hear me okay? I switched to headphones. A bunch of uh, family activity happening. <laughs> Yes. Um, so thanks so much. So now we've got time to try to get through as many of these questions as we can. And I've got them written out. And so our first one um, from Mrs. D. Rose was, what's the difference between perlite and vermiculite? Are they interchangeable and is one better than the other? That is such a good question. Um, so there are two different minerals um, and, um, and perlite, um, perlite has been um, basically popped kind of like popcorn. Um, and the purpose of perlite, more than anything, is to provide um, space for air in potting soil. And then vermiculite um, is, is also a rock, um, and, um, but it's, really, it's like a really shiny pearlescent rock that, that basically is processed into these tiny little shiny flakes. Um, and vermiculite is more, more commonly used um, as, uh, as things like a covering um, for seeds that need a little bit of access to light um, to germinate. Um, so vermiculite is less typically mixed into potting soil um, and more typically used on top of potting soil to cover up, um, uh, just lightly cover up seeds that need um, just a little bit of light to germinate. And our second question, which is Sean, I think we covered, but he was asking about, I think, the, um, the quantities of organic fertilizers. Yes. So, you know, so re read through that bag. Um, you know, every organic fertilizer, and actually I'm going to stop. Should I stop share or keep this up? It's your preference. I'll just keep it up for now. Or if you have something okay. else you'd like to share or go back, we can okay. keep it up for Sounds now. Sounds good. Um, so, you know, definitely read the instructions on that bag, um, but for, for most organic fertilizers, um, it, it generally boils down to like a tablespoon of organic fertilizer um, that you, you would either, you know, for like for bigger plants, um, like a, something that you're going to harvest the whole head or something like a tomato plant, you're going to use that whole tablespoon on, for one plant, mix it down into the planting hole. And then for something like carrots or radishes where you, you know, maybe you'll have um, five, six, six radishes over a foot of space. That one, tea, that one tablespoon of fertilizer, you're probably going to spread over that whole foot of, of space that those radishes are going to grow in. Um, so that's, um, so read the instructions. Um, the instructions are inevitably a little confusing on the, on the bags of fertilizer, but that for organic fertilizers, that's generally what it boils down to. All right, and Sean, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna get your follow up because we should have too many on here, but if we get to the end, we'll go to it. Um, so our next one is, how can I treat septoria leaf spots on tomatoes and peppers? 
yank those plants out and yeah, put them in right. the dumpster. <laughs> nah, no treatment for most plant diseases, unfortunately. Yeah, that is true. You know, so for most plant diseases, um, especially if for the purposes of, um, you know, like school garden rules or, or wherever your growing space is, if you have to follow the, the like the basic, the basic organic rules, um, prevention is really um, the biggest ally that you have. Um, most organic um, treatments um, will at, at the most slow the spread of a disease down enough that you can get another harvest or two out of it, but aren't really going to stop it. Um, once you start getting into um, conventional controls, the most effective conventional controls, the ones that can actually like bring something like septoria leaf spot to a, to a halt, um, are um, they are um, regulated substances. So you would actually need um, to get a special license to even purchase the stuff that's going to be the most effective. Um, so when you know that you have um, a pretty significant disease um, in, your, in one of your crops, um, it can be so painful. But usually the best thing to do is that as soon as you recognize that you have a significant problem of some sort with a disease, is to actually just remove those plants. Don't put them in the compost. You need to actually get them off site um, because most, most um, plant diseases and pathogens will um, survive just fine in a home home scale composting system. And for Jack, yeah, we'll have um, like a PDF version of the slides and all the other resources on the Google Drive um, that should be sent out as well as an email to y'all, but it's here in the chat as well. And that will have all the resources that we talked about today. Um, and so I saw some more discussion in the chat in here, and I'm actually curious your answer, Sarah. So I think we might have a slightly different one from our program, but are we permitted to collect rainwater? Asked Hill 508. That's a good question. So I would, my answer to that is, um, it probably depends. You know, there's, um, so if, depends on how you go about collecting rainwater. Um, so, well, depends on a few different things. Um, so if, if the rainwater that you are collecting is first hitting a roof of some sort and then being funneled down into a barrel, um, that, that roof very likely has a lot of stuff on it that is not ideal for school gardens. Um, if it's an asphalt roof, um, little bits of asphalt will, um, will actually end up in that rain barrel. Um, and um, roofing shingles um, are definitely full of all sorts of stuff um, that is um, not good for human health. Um, and then um, bir birds and other critters like to hang out. Um, birds, um, lizards, iguanas, um, things like that like to hang out on roofs. Um, they poop while they're up there um, and, and that poop goes directly down into your rain barrel. Um, and then there's, you know, other kinds of roofing, um, you know, like if you have a metal roof, um, when that metal roof first goes up, there's some coating on that metal roof that takes a while to actually break down. And for a while, the coating on the metal roof kind of sloughs off. Um, eventually, it becomes a much safer thing to collect rainwater from. So, um, you know, if you, and if you're going with just like a big old open barrel, um, you know, you might still get some, you know, just kind of catching whatever rain happens to fall directly out of the sky. Um, you may still have some, you know, birds that fly over and make deposits and things like that, um, or land in your barrel and make deposits. So if you are going to use rain barrel water, um, it's generally best to use it um, for the purposes of school gardens, um, because you are working with a population that is pretty um, susceptible, you know, to, to getting sick with different things. Um, and there's a, li a lot of liability that comes with that. Um, you're better, you're really better off using that on ornamental plants, um, that, that rain barrel water. Um, you know, and if you, if you feel very, um, very much like um, you just really want to use that rain bar barrel water on edibles, um, you can actually get filtration systems. Um, you can, um, you can put, um, you know, bleach in to make sure the pathogens are killed, things like that. But it definitely becomes more of a process to make sure that it is actually a food safe water source. So uh, I, you know, like when I, when I garden at home, i you know, I'm feeding myself, so I, I feel okay about what I am collecting in a rain barrel. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not necessarily water that I would use for, um, for the purposes of feeding food to other people. <laughs> yeah, same. Uh, for our program, we, FNP, no longer um, will support rain barrels, and for the same reasons, just be extra super safe with food safety and making sure that there's no possible 
chance for contamination. Yep. Uh, so another good question, next one here um, from Sue Rihani is, if the IFAS website gives a planting calendar. For instance, if, if October shows tomatoes, can one plant the seeds outdoors in October? That's a great question. Um, theoretically, yes. Um, you can theoretically start with seeds um, for tomatoes outdoors. Um, in terms of how much success that you'll have, if you start by directly seeding um, tomatoes, um, it's, it's not going to be the same level of, of success as if you started with, um, with tomato plants, especially it also depends on what part of Florida you're in. Um, you know, so like if you're in North Florida, um, those plants will definitely be hit by frost um, before, well, not definitely, nothing, nothing is definite in life, but um, very, very likely be hit by frost before they're actually mature. Um, and then, you know, and then across most of Florida, um, uh, we're still getting some pretty significant um, rain right around then. And so really young seedlings um, don't do well with getting battered with rain. Um, and tomatoes are really finicky when they're getting started. They really don't do well with being wet, getting battered, getting too much wind. Um, they, there's a lot of disease pressure. So if you can start with tomatoes that spent their, their first six to eight weeks indoors, um, getting really good and healthy and strong and disease free, and then pop them in the ground, um, you'll have much more success than, um, than starting directly with seeds. Then our next question from Nishad, uh, we're gonna talk about mulching. He said, what about plastic mulching? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, plastic mulch, um, there, people, um, people call it all sorts of different things, um, but for, for the most part, um, plastic mulch, um, when people are talking about plastic mulch, they're talking about kind of two different categories. One is um, people sometimes also call landscape fabric, which is like a thick woven, um, um, mat basically that you see in a lot of um, you see used for a lot of residential um, ornamental landscapes and things like that and then covered in in like bark mulch or something um, that that can be that can be great to keep um, a lot of especially in pathways um, and then um, you know and then long-term plantings like if you know you're going to be planting a lot of perennial plants um, like like lemongrass or um, uh, Cuban oregano, things like that, um, that can be a great thing. But you would need to cover that, um, that landscape fabric up with something because, because it's, it gets so hot. Um, um, and um, so then the other category that people sometimes call um, plastic mulch um, is a really thin, very made to be reg um, regularly disposed of like every six months or so. Um, basically like just plastic, like a roll of plastic pretty much, um, thicker than saran wrap, um, but um, trying to think thinner than, I don't know, about the, about the thickness of like a page in a book. Um, and it comes in four different colors. Um, one color is black. Um, from, from most of Florida, um, black plastic mulch is not a great idea simply because um, it's already so hot down here that it just adds too much heat into the system. When I was farming um, in a more northern area, I used black plastic a lot. It's what allowed me to be successful with growing things like tomatoes because I didn't have enough heat. But down here, it provides too much heat in the system. So a lot of folks actually like to use, a lot of farmers in this area, actually use white plastic mulch because it actually helps to bring down the temperature of soil um, and that can really help with some disease pressure and just general plant stress. Um, there's also silver reflective mulch. Um, this is um, relatively newish. Um, it's been around for about 10 years but it's really starting to catch on especially in the southeast um, and one of the things that, that silver reflective mulch does is that it bounces light onto the underside of plant leaves. And the reason that that um, is important, um, or is effective rather, is that most of the insects that, um, that like hang out and, and sap and suck all of the energy out of plants, um, hang out on the underside of leaves. And they're under there because they don't like direct light. Um, and so that silver reflective mulch shoots light up onto the undersides of leaves that, that, um, that insects like thrips and aphids tend to be hanging out on. So it can really help actually with insect pressure. And a lot of those insects are insects that actually introduce the diseases that eventually take your plants out. 
So that's, that's another thing. And then there's a couple other colors, like there's some red mulch that's being experimented with and some green mulch. Um, but that's a very long winded answer. I would add too that um, for those of us with the school with our school gardens, these smaller things, you want to be careful with the plastic mulch too. You're not creating little water holding mosquito breeding zones. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. And so plastic mulches are, are generally something that you see used on farms, um, generally not something you use you see used on gardens, um, but you can, you know, like there, you absolutely can. Um, but um, it also blows away in the wind unless you have it really well tucked in and secured with a little bit of soil holding it down. And we got another pretty good complicated potential question here from Nishad, which is any cover crops better than mulch? That's a, that's a great question. Yeah, so for those of you who are not familiar with what a cover crop is, um, the easiest way to think about a cover crop is that it is some sort of plant um, like a crop that you intentionally plant, but not for the purpose of harvesting it. You're planting it instead for the purpose of it simply covering your soil, um, adding, adding plant material back into your soil, uh, like when you mow it down and incorporate it. Um, and it just, it helps to hold your soil in place and it helps to, to build um, th that good soil food web um, and just build the general health of your soil. So farms use, um, cover crops a lot, um, but most of the cover crops that, that have been developed um, are, are plants that, um, that tend to get really big, that, that usually require some sort of mechanical, like AKA tractor, um, um, to actually incorporate them. So um, most gardeners don't go the cover crop route. However, there definitely are some really great cover crops for, um, for really small spaces, even like raised beds. Um, things like um, buckwheat, uh, tillage radish, um, some things like that. So, um, and some of these, some of these um, cover crops that actually do work pretty well in really small places like raised beds um, have some pretty, pretty neat um, benefits to them. You know, for example, um, things like um, a tillage radish is basically like a really, it's like a daikon radish that's been bred for cover crop. Um, as it breaks down, um, it adds a huge amount of um, food to the soil, basically, like that organic matter part to the soil. And it also lets out some horrible stink. Um, the, the smell of rotting radish is truly tremendous, but that smell that you don't like is actually the exact same chemical that repels nematodes. So if you have some significant nematode issues um, and you don't mind um, some truly incredible stinky radish smell, planting something like tillish rat tillage radish in beds that you're struggling with nematodes in is hugely beneficial. Um, and then there's other things like buckwheat, um, some other um, phacelia, there's some other small, small cover crops that, that have all sorts of added benefits. Um, in general, um, mulching tends to be um, just a, a more accessible, easier thing for gardeners. Um, but if you, if you really enjoy cover crops, um, then it's a really fun added fun and very effective added thing to add into your, your garden management, for sure. So another, all these questions are amazing. So another good one is, uh, which kind of mulch works better? And a big one that I have dealt with in the past is do certain types of wood attract pests to the garden from uh, Watson J. So that's a, that's a really good question. So um, one, little, one interesting little, um, little tidbit is that, um, Plants, let me see, what's the best way to phrase this? In, in general, um, woody plants, so like plants that, um, like trees, shrubs, um, you know, like plants that have some degree of like wood element to them do best when they are mulched with wood mulches. So, you know, like chipped, you know, chipped pine or, you know, chipped oak or whatever it might be. Um, there's specific, um, bacteria and fungus that, that have these really, truly amazing um, interactions and associations with, with um, decomposing woody plant material that feed really well back into those woody plants. Um, and conversely, plants that are much more like vegetative. Um, so things like, you know, grasses or your vegetables or herbs or things like that, they tend to do better with mulches that are that come from other vegetative sorts of plants. Um, um, and, and for the exact same reason, the kinds of 
um, like fungal and good bacterial associations that build up with them actually feed in better um, in this really beautiful, complicated way into those plants. So if you can, um, so you, you absolutely can use wood mulches um, on vegetable gardens. You absolutely can. Um, and, you know, and your plants will love you even more if you can find a non a non woody mulch to use. Um, but one one thing to be really cautious about um, with with wood mulches is that um, you don't want to push that wood mulch down into your garden soil. Um, that wood mulch is basically pure carbon, and um, there's there's this, this incredible process that happens in soil where um, carbon and nitrogen bind together really strongly. Um, and there's, um, there's, always, there's almost always more carbon available down there than nitrogen. And plants need a lot of nitrogen, right? And so when you push that carbon down into the soil, that carbon in the form of wood chips actually grabs all the available nitrogen and your plants are going to look really nutrient starved. But if you just keep the wood chips on top and make sure that they don't make their way down into your soil, you shouldn't have that problem. So that's, I know that's not exactly um, the answer. Um, so let me give the, the next layer to, to this. Uh, that, was, that was the side note, the, pre, the preliminary answer to the actual answer. So um, I forgot where I was going with that. Um, mulch. Oh yeah, so, there, um, so for, for folks that are, um, that are unfamiliar with the kind of critters that naturally live in, in woody mulches, like bark mulch or um, you know, like tree trimming debris mulch, those sorts of things, um, you will often see um, a lot of millipedes in there and think, oh goodness, these, these things can't be doing anything good, right? Um, but in Florida, those millipedes are actually basically doing the same thing that earthworms do in most of the rest of the country. Um, I know that a lot of folks that I work with down here in Sarasota County feel like they must be doing something wrong because they can't find any earthworms in their soil, but they have more millipedes than they know what to do with. And they think those millipedes are eating their vegetables. Um, so millipedes are actually um, detritivores. They, they are decomposers, just like earthworms are. Um, so they, they do not actually eat um, fresh, you know, fresh still living plant material. They wait until that plant material is dead and then they decompose it just like earthworms do. So um, a lot of folks um, see those millipedes um, and think, um, ooh, something, something bad's going on here. Um, and it must be the fault of all this, um, this woody mulch that I'm using. Um, but it's actually a really good sign. So those detritivores, those millipedes and other critters, they're, they are, they're breaking down that really dense uh, material and making it available to your plants. So they're actually doing something great. So I wouldn't worry too much about about um, insects that fall into that category that you're seeing, um, you know, um, and then in like down in the area that I'm in, um, we don't really have troubles with, with snails and slugs and things like that. But I, I think further north in the state, um, where it's a, a bit cooler in the winter, um, those wood those woody mulches will definitely um, be a really really nice place for snails and slugs to lay their eggs. And confirm, I have yes <laughs> snail infestation in my garden right now and. and Previous years, I, I think it was mostly due to weak plants, but had roly polies that seemed to be attacking or eating um, the live plants. But I think that was mostly because they were already having some issues. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I hope if everyone, everyone gets from these answers a little bit, that anything of gardening can get really deep, really fast, and you don't need to master all of this to have a successful garden. Um, oh. But if you like learning these things, it is a lifetime of really exciting things to learn. Uh, so we got 12 more minutes. I don't know if I'll get through all of these, but we'll try to. And if we don't get your question, please feel free to reach out um, to any of us individually. And I'm, I'm sure we'd be glad to help you answer them. Uh, so Ms. Brown asks, can you plant seeds beyond expiration date? Yeah, you absolutely can. So, it, well, it, and it depends. So you can always plant seeds. Um, you, um, some seeds are going to be way more viable than others past that expiration date. So there's some really, there's some really great charts. Um, I don't have um, an example of one off the top of my head, um, but there's some really great charts that we can, we can actually just send out with um, follow-up information um, that tell you how long different types of seeds are viable for. And when I say viable, what I mean is um, how long after that stamped by date um, are they actually going to germinate and produce a healthy plant. 
Um, so um, an, an example of um, a couple of plants that have a really short um, window of viability, um, onions and carrots. They're really only one year. So only buy as, not, as, as much onion and carrot seed as you need because um, their viability just tanks after year one. Um, there's other, other things that do well for you know, two or three years, um, three to four years, four to five years. Um, there's some varieties of corn that can go decades. Um, and then all of your seed will do better if you keep it in a, in a kind of airtight climate controlled place. Um, and so you know, something like a Tupperware is, uh, is perfectly sufficient for airtight. Um, and then um, in, in a cool place out of direct sunlight. Um, some folks like to just keep all their seeds in the freezer. You can certainly do that. Um, what you, what you want to avoid is temperature fluctuations more than anything. Um, all right, for our next one, I'm going to jump ahead to some of these ones I think are more relevant. Uh, does solarization work as a remedy to nematodes? Uh, Jacqueline with Wise Tribe would like to know. Yes, and I think actually, um, I, um, I saw your name pop up in the waiting room just after we talked about that topic. Um, so I, um, with, with solarization, um, but um, yeah, so solarization is that process of basically cooking your soil um, with a sheet of plastic um, in order to help um, control nematodes. Um, and um, it is, um, it, it is effective ish. Um, it is as effective pretty much um, as any of the most effective things are against nematodes, nematodes are kind of, kind of like roaches in that you think you have gotten rid of them and then they just come back. Um, they are kind of bomb proof. They have been around for millions and millions and millions of years longer than we have. Um, and so getting rid of nematodes entirely um, will just never happen. Um, but in terms of something to use as part of your um, you know, maybe once a year or once every few year process, um, it can be it can be really helpful. And but, but just remember that, along with the nematodes, um, the process will kill absolutely every last thing that's in that soil. Every every good thing that ever lived in that soil will be just as dead as the nematodes. So you'll have to really um, work on bringing the life back to the soil. I'm going to do a few more questions. I think this covers pretty much all of them we got here. I think most of the ones you also you covered during the presentation. Um, should you put fertilizer in soil at the same time you put seeds in or wait a day or two? Um, Watson J. Pass. That's a great question. Um, I, um, you know, as someone who um, comes from the world of farming, um, I um, have always been of the camp of do, do things once efficiently and move on. <laughs> so I've always kind of in one fell swoop um, laid the fertilizer, gotten it a little bit incorporated down, and seeded right next to it. I don't seed directly into that line of fertilizer. I seed basically like right next to it um, so that when those seeds germinate, um, the fertilizer, it's not touching fertilizer, so it doesn't burn them. Um, but if, if, you really, if you like that, that really kind of that staggered process um, where, you know, because there's a lot of, it's a, from seed to actually harvesting something, there's a lot of delayed gratification, right? And so um, in terms of staying engaged with that space, it can be really nice actually to take a pause between when you plant something and then coming back a few days later to put some fertilizer, coming back a few days later um, to see what's germinated, heck it, the first few little weeds that have popped up. You know, So you can really decide how you wanna do that. Um, but coming from a production background where everything was about extreme time management, um, I've always kind of just done it all, done it all once. <laughs> Uh, and then I think I might get to your other question, Watson, but let's do, let's do the second to last question. Our penultimate question is, you spoke about diseases. What can I do about the disease, and this might be multiple diseases, that causes spots on zucchini, melons, and cucumbers? So yeah, lot, there's lots of diseases. Um, that, that is a category of crop um, that has um, more diseases under the sun than you can um, shake a stick at. Um, lots and lots and lots. Um, it, you know, without, without being able to see the plants, um, it's, hard, it's hard to know what spectrum of, um, of diseases might be there. Um, but with, those, with that particular spectrum of plants, um, most of the diseases that would be causing spots are going to come from three different sources. Um, one are insects, insects that fall into this category of like sucking, um, they suck juice out. Um, 
they, those, the insects that actually suck juice out of plant leaves, um, they actually inject a little bit of liquid into the plant first, and that passes diseases from plants to plants. So um, there's this one whole category of disease where if you can keep the biting, sucking insects off of your plants, that will really help um, with preventing that category of disease. Um, and then there's another category of diseases um, that basically just hang out in the soil waiting for the next, um, the next host plant. Um, and so for um, most of those diseases, though, don't actually get pulled up to the root system. It requires actually landing on the plant leaves. So keeping your soil mulched is, um, is quite helpful. Um, mulching your soil helps to prevent soil from actually splashing up onto the plant leaves. Um, and that's actually another, um, to go back to um, a, a previous question about planting, planting some things that you would typically transplant, but doing it instead direct seeded. That's actually another reason to transplant is because so many of the, the diseases that you find on plants in this area live in soil. Um, as soon as a plant emerges from its seed, it pushes leaves up through soil, right? So it, it had like the process of emerging actually um, makes contact with soil. And if there's any disease disease um, in, in that soil, it's already on the plant when the plant is, you know, a quarter inch tall. So um, using transplants when, when that's reasonable, keeping your soil mulched is really, really helpful. Um, and, then, um, and then there's a whole category of, um, of fungal diseases that affect um, the cucumber family and, and all sorts of plants. Um, and those, um, if you can learn how to control the wind, that, that will be your cure to that. <laughs> they literally blow in on the wind um, and the spores of a lot of the fungal um, diseases that affect vegetable crops in Florida, a lot of them can actually blow for, um, for miles on the wind, which is pretty wild to think about. Um, they kind of blow up from South Florida and kind of make their way up the whole United States kind of every year. Yep, exactly. Yep. <laughs> so, so there, there you go. There's the answer to that one. Learn how to control the wind. But no, but, but seriously, um, so one of the best things you can do for um, prevent or for, uh, for, for staving off those fungal diseases as long as possible is to make sure that your plants actually have enough airflow, which sounds a little counterintuitive, um, but think about how quickly um, your shower stall molds at home, right? There, there's basically no airflow in your shower stall at home, um, you know, compared to, um, you know, an outdoor space that also stays wet. Um, you know, being able, being able to have a plant that is not constantly wet and up close, um, kind of clogged up with other plants and not getting enough airflow. Um, just, you know, having a, having a plant that is wet all the time or doesn't get enough airflow, you're gonna get disease, um, fungal diseases a lot more quickly that will spread more quickly and take a plant out more quickly. So back to that Goldilocks and the three bears issue of plant spacing. Yeah, and if you can, when you're buying the plants or seeds, um, trying to make sure you can get stuff that's bred to have different resistances. Could be huge yes. here in Florida, especially things like the, I what they're called, like the shotgun splot one and some of those others that they do have some resistant varieties available. Yes. Okay, and then for our final question, I'm glad someone asked because I could also use this. Um, what does it mean that there are lots of snails in the garden? Too much moisture? Why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, snails love, um, they love moisture for sure. They love moisture. They, they love a nice little safe protected space. Um, and, um, you know, it may also be that you happen to be in a place that's having a major snail outbreak. Um, you know, I, I've actually been hearing a lot <laughs> this year of um, people, people in all sorts of different regions of Florida that are having snail, snail boom populations like they've never seen before in their entire lives, including like in the middle of a cow, like um, uh, fencing in the middle of a cow pasture where like a single fence post will have 300 snails on it. Yeah, and like people like people have no idea what's happening. So I think that um, I think to some extent there's some some variability year to year about what snail populations are going to look like. But yes, snails need moisture, they need cover, um, they need nice green things to eat. Um, and um, your garden is often um, a really great place for that particular combination. Um, learn learn what snail and slug eggs look like. Um, you can actually um, they, they look like little, 
they're like little clear, clearish gummy little balls that are laid in little clumps about the size of a very small grape. Um, and um, they, once you learn what they look like, um, you'll start seeing them. Um, you can actually kind of set snail traps if you want to. Snails, snails and slugs particularly like laying eggs underneath um, partially rotted wood. Um, so toss, toss some partially rotted wood, you know, kind of beside your garden. And then every few days come, come by and flip that, that wood over and just scrape the slug eggs off of it. Um, that's, that's something I have definitely done a good bit of in my life where I, where I used to farm. It was um, epic amounts of slugs and snails. They were actually probably my number one pest. Um, there's also, and if you're, if you're just like so done with snugs, slugs and snails, there's also some um, products on the market um, that, you can, that you can purchase that um, slugs eat it. Um, and it's, it's not a poison. It's actually like a physical, um, a physical um, pesticide where they, they eat it and it literally cuts up their digestive system from the inside. It's a kind of a terrible way to die. Um, but that will also help you get them under control if they're just totally out of control. So, awesome. Well, thank you so very much, happy Sarah. Note. We made it straight to five o'clock. I think we actually got through e almost the entire Q&A, which was Woo, great. That's amazing. Um, I asked about expand the whole series is kind of an expansion on this. This is sort of the 101. So our next session will be on planting. Um, and I'll put in a whole list of them here in chat. And yeah, join the Facebook group if you're interested in communicating with people that way. Um, and yeah, contact your local IFSA extension. We also have always have a whole lot of stuff like this happening and are everywhere in Florida at least. So thanks again for everyone for joining and for about half of us sticked around for the Q&A, which is awesome. And yeah, everyone have a nice day and stay safe out there and happy gardening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.